one for our uh, usual webinars with the sales coach. It's uh, good to see everyone and um, we are going to continue our series of uh, meeting the people and um, having the guests for the uh, interviews. So today we have a special guest which we were uh, promising uh, last week and um, that's going to be uh, John Emmett. If you remember our uh, interview last uh, week with uh, Lila Xu from China. So that is her coach who uh, helped her to achieve her gold medal in London 2012. And it's a coach, it's a very, very well-known coach in the uh, high performance uh, scene. He's been around for 20 years, so he was co coaching multiple um, nations. Now he's uh, working with the Olympic team from Finland. And um, let's meet him. It's John Emmett. I don't think we need to do a lot of introduction, but uh, today he's going to be talking about... Uh, he um, was writing down in his amazing books and uh, probably most of you should uh, have a look at it and uh, whatever we were talking in the past webinars of things how to improve it's well written down in the book how to actually uh, practice there are a set of exercises and there are a lot of tips uh, how to put things together and how to help your own sailing uh, while you have no coaching or you are uh, like lacking in some information. So here we are. John, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Hi, John. Really good introduction, and it's really nice to see uh, so many people online. So I will run through the various slides, uh, but maybe if you pick up some questions, I'm quite happy to answer them as we go along. So today's uh, webinar is about coaching yourself to win. And I think this is probably something which is very relevant because a lot of people will be without a coach. And in fact, with social distancing, a lot of people are going to be sailing completely on their own. And when I wrote uh, my original book, the idea uh, I was just coming back from injury was to make the most of every day and every hour of every day and every minute of every hour of the training that you did. So a lot of uh, self-coaching is about breaking things down. So we're going to be doing this as a, as a two-part talk. And the, the first section is really about the importance of goal setting. And it's something that's, that's just amazing. If uh, you manage to catch uh, Lily's interview, uh, she said she actually wrote down that she wanted to be World Sailor of the Year and she achieved that in 2012. And to look at another laser sailor, uh, the Cypriot, uh, Pavos, uh, again, he wrote down, he had a, a very clear goal that he wanted to be World Sailor of the Year and, and he achieved that. Now, just writing things down, of course, doesn't guarantee you success there's an awful lot to it and we'll cover this in these two webinars but it certainly helps it's a constant reminder and for any people who are studying at the moment I would really suggest writing things down is a very good way of learning and remembering and the importance of goal setting it's not just in sailing it's actually something which is important in every aspect of your life so if you're, you're looking at a secondary sport or if you're looking very much at business goals, writing things down. It's very important. We talk about smart goals or possibly smarter goals now. So you have a, a goal which is specific, measurable, it's uh, agreed with the other parties. We're not all just laser sailors, realistic and perhaps time framed. And the reason that that is so important, if you imagine yourself as a 14 year old optimist sailor achieving an olympic gold medal that year is is highly unrealistic but to achieve that goal in a in a 12 year period of time that that may be infinitely achievable and these goals they they want to be both uh, exciting and rewarding 
So what I've done here, if we look at the slide on the right hand side, is to look at breaking down an individual goal because you need short, medium and long term goals. They're all very important. And this is what I mean by specific. So if somebody uh, comes for a coaching session and they say they want to sail faster, that's very difficult to achieve because there's so many different uh, parts of that. Whereas if we look at a particular condition, a particular uh, point of sailing, and maybe even a particular technique, then we can look at that. So the example on the right, we're just having a little look at the different aspects of tacking. And the reason I like this um, dartboard type graphical um, representation, it's very easy to see much easier than writing things down number. One at the moment, because nobody really knows exactly what's going to happen. But I just want to go through the guiding principles. So the idea is that it's very hard to, to peak more than once a year. And indeed, for people looking at Olympic performance, you're trying to uh, peak probably once a year for maybe the world championships or your Olympic qualification and then once every four years for the Olympics. If you're a club sailor you might just want to peak for your club championships but it's the same. It's important to have these mini peaks and then you have some time off to allow uh, the opportunity to avoid uh, illness and injury by having that much needed downtime. So the first thing is you've got to be honest with how prepared are you? So something like improving your physical fitness could easily take 10 to 12 weeks. And it might be something you need to look at doing before you actually do much sailing. So for example, if you were going from a laser to a, to a fin, or even from a radial to a laser, then there might be quite a lot of conditioning that has to happen. And that's very important for peaking at the correct time that you do first things first. So uh, I like this little graph, we just call it performance hills and it's quite easy to see. Um, and the people who perform best at the major regattas are often those who've got their peak spot on. And a very good way of achieving this is just to have some checklists. So you can keep referring back, where am I? Where was I? Where do I need to be? So with the main uh, championships of the year, you actually need to prepare for a specific venue. And I think sailing is a wonderful sport because actually nearly every day on the water is very different. So if you're looking at sailing in Portland Harbor in a, in a northerly, in flat, flat water, shifty conditions, it's almost a different sport to, for example, sailing in Enoshima in the big swell. And I think just the most important thing, and I know it's a cliche, is to get that time on the water, just to know the venue. And we'll come to that um, probably in the second presentation when we look at, at mental skills, but just to feel confident in the weather patterns and you know the, the venue. And part of that is the logistics. So if a, a venue's a, a long way away, you, you need to get there early if you're going to perform. And I don't know what will happen in the long term with the, with the air travel, etc. But we had the Laser Worlds, Radial Worlds in Melbourne this year. And I think Sandy did a fantastic job. That's Sandy and Yacht Club. But for a lot of people, thinking specifically Europeans, it was a huge amount of travel and a huge amount of jet lag. So people needed to get early, they, so book, book early, arrive early, that saves both time and money, and just to get familiar with what was, what was going on. And I think uh, certainly in the next few years, those logistical challenges, they're, they're gonna be even more important because actually the time you spend at the venue is much more important than the time you, you would spend at, at home. So by the weather patterns, we, we look at the big picture. So for example, if you need to train during the, the summertime, 
um, the weather conditions may be quite different to the winter time. So you need to think about when you're going to visit the venue, what's most important. And then the wind patterns. I think we all will have experienced this where we're very familiar with a particular venue and we, we just tack because it feels the right thing to do. And that's, that's just because we've had the experience of that venue. So I'm sure people who are eyeing uh, the 2024 Olympics will, will be looking at going to Marseille whenever they have the chance. And this wind patterns, it's a very important idea. And I said a lot of it will be subconscious, but you will see I have the, the wet notes there. And I, from the previous slide, I am a, a huge believer in trying to write things down, record them because that way you can go back and review the knowledge and see whether what you thought is correct is backed up by data. And actually it's gonna help you remember things. So if we go back, uh, we have our peaks and this is where we're gonna you know, really think when we were doing the very best we can, what, what was the thing we were doing? And we're gonna make sure that we, we write it down. And we have that record and that's something I'm a big believer in. So perhaps not the most uh, crucial thing for uh, a laser sailor is the, the technology. We're very lucky to be in a one design uh, boat and we've had small changes to the class, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing. I'm a big fan of the composite top sections. It was um, unfortunate with the aluminium ones. Sometimes we had to straighten them. So I'm super happy not to be doing that anymore. And I think any little bits of technology we want to, to keep up with. I work with many other classes other than the laser. And it's been really useful to take knowledge from those and apply them to the laser. Uh, just as it's really interesting to take things from the laser, the sort of physical side and the training side to other classes. Um, we're always looking for the perfect solution. In the UK, I work with a company called Southeast Sailboats, uh, looking at the rigging lines. And it's amazing, a boat as simple as a laser, you can still make the rigging a little bit better by small changes here and there. The thing I would say though, is wherever possible, try and keep things simple because you want to avoid the chances of anything breaking or it can be easily replaced and repaired and including that having spares. I think the laser is a perfect boat because a lot of the time you can jump on the plane, you take your tiller, you take your sail, you take your ropes and off you go. But those little changes, having a, a really stiff tiller that fits really well in your stock and is really well to the cleat makes a huge difference. And if you look at the scores from any regatta, regardless of where you finish, the points are often really close. And I think we all will have got to the end of a regatta wishing we just had 10 less points in our total score. So I've tried to, to go through things in a, in a logical order. And a lot of people will, will say that starting the 60% of the race or something like that, I think it's very hard to quantify this. But what I will say, it's very, very important. And I don't think people necessarily win regattas, but they certainly lose regattas by making mistakes. So in the UK, we have uh, what we call a fire triangle. So if, if you have a big fire, uh, you can put the fire out either by removing the fuel, removing the oxygen, or removing the heat, and then the fire goes out. Well, I think of a, a start very much like that. So without going into detail, we have time, distance, and acceleration. So if any one of those is wrong, we've got a bad start. So uh, very quickly, if you're two seconds early or two seconds late, that is not a good start. And then when we look at the distance, if you're on the line or a boat length behind the line, that's the difference between a good and a bad start. And last, and in some ways, possibly the most important is acceleration. So there's no point being at the favoured end, right on the line, if you're not moving. And I think sailors will often underestimate how long it takes to get to full speed. And part of that is 90% speed feels very similar to 100% speed. And that last 10%, it can... It can take one, two, three seconds to get, depending on the conditions. But
that that can equate to the difference between rolling somebody or being rolled. Now, starting is not all about, and we'll come to this later, starting at the favoured end of the line. That is the end which is most upwind. We need to consider the wind and the tide. So the line may be biased one way, but a helpful tide or a hindering tide may mean that actually we want to start at the other end. So one of the things we'll get to later is considering the big picture. So for example, if you want to go right, then maybe it's easier to go right if you start at the right hand side of the start line and so on. And it's the same for wind. If we're in a northern hemisphere venue, we expect the sea breeze to go right. And if we're in a southern hemisphere, we would expect it to go left. So starting is not merely about being the most upwind at start time. It's about having a good race. And actually, I'm going to rephrase that. A good start is actually about being in a good position 30 seconds after the start time, not at the go. And that's why whenever I run starting exercises, we, we will hold the lane for a little bit to see who truly had a good start. Because having space and the ability to sail at full speed is very important. And that's what bringing to the third point. Remember the rest of the race. It's so easy to uh, get so locked into beating the boats around you that you actually uh, miss the first shift or or actually get the ley line wrong or one of these big errors. So starting is very important, but it's not everything. The little diagram on the right, one of my favorite exercises you can do without a coach, just three people lining up. And by lining up, I mean you need to be um, in a straight line upwind and completely stopped. So this is acceleration exercise, if you like, not a starting exercise. And then the boat in the middle, and it's a bit of trust here. So everyone has to have their ratchet blocks on so we can see what's going. The boat in the middle shouts three, two, one, go. And it's only on the go that you're allowed to start moving forward. So again, this is acceleration exercise, not a starting exercise because the start will probably be say three or four seconds after the go, depending on the conditions. Now this little exercise, we will carry on until and there's two ways of doing this. Either we wait until one boat has clearly won or we wait until one boat has clearly lost and then we restart. And you can do this as much as you like, um, hopefully good social distancing. Um, you have uh, maybe three on starboard attack and then three on port and you can do a long upwind like this because I said it's a really important skill. And boat handling in general doesn't win you races, but it can certainly lose races. And this is a fantastic picture of Paul Goodison, uh, one of the uh, best life win laser sailors in the world. And uh, funnily enough, he's also a multiple Moth World Champion now and an America's Cup sailor. So these skills are so transferable. And if you move into more high performance boats, actually you can't really go racing until you, you get the boat handling sorted. I remember in the in the 49er, people told me, you know, respect the bear away, because if you can't do a good bear away or good head up, it's not only slow, you could probably end up going for a swim, which is very, very slow. So one of the top tips is regardless of the boat, you, you need to have the mast in the air at all times. And the, the tacks and the jibes, again, it's it's such an important thing. And the best way to, to practice this is to go out and do really focused sessions. So I'm very reluctant to coach for just one day. I always want to do training blocks and then you can have a real focus. So you do just tacks and jibes and then maybe finish on half an hour of racing for interest. If you try and do a little bit of everything, it's much harder to improve. And the point of a good tack and a good jibe, we need to be clear on our mindset. The point is really to maximize our gain in the direction we're sailing. So a good tack is not necessarily fast and a good tack is not necessarily quick. A good tack is a tack that maximizes your progress towards the windward mark. And I want you to really think about that because those are not necessarily the same things. Sometimes you have to tack very quickly because of avoiding a right-of-way boat, we're gonna go over ley line, etc. But generally speaking, you're 
the process, maximize the gain to the next mark. And it's the same with run to run drives. It's not always about being quick. Sometimes it's about choosing the, the right place on the wave and actually being able to, to maintain going almost dead down wind. And I think the difference between tacks and jibes between five knots, 50 knots and 25 knots is perhaps smaller than people would expect, um, even though the body movements change a lot. And that brings me on to a third point, which is changing gear. And it happens a lot. We, we launch in, in 10 knots and flat water, the sea breeze kicks in, the current uh, changes because of the tide times. And then all of a sudden we're in 15 knots and choppy water. And the boat handling has to change because of that. I think uh, a good way to start thinking about it is if the, the waves are big and long and slow, then the steering is large steering, but smooth and, and steady. If it's a, a short choppy wave, then actually we're probably gonna be doing short choppy steering, um, unless of course, it's so close you can't steer accurately, in which case probably we will go into a, into a more bow down mode. So sailing low and fast because that's the easiest way to get over the, the speed bumps. And flat water, it makes uh, the boat handling much easier, but there's still gains and losses to be had. And actually in the flat water, in a straight line, you, you probably want to minimize steering. And for the boat handling, you want to do as much as you can with body weight and sheep and all these things talking now very much to a laser audience but they're true of any boat and perhaps the faster the boat the, the less you need to uh, steer because there's more water or rather the water is going faster over the foils so before we talk about tactics and strategy i'm going to repeat myself slightly over the next two slides we have to divine them i've done a lot of work with people whose first language isn't English, although probably their, their grammar and their spelling is better than mine, but we need to be clear we're talking about the same thing. So when I define tactics, that is simply the boat to boat interactions. That's covering somebody being covered. That's whether we duck, sorry, whether we duck, whether we slow down, or whether we tack underneath somebody. These type of factors, that's boat to boat tactics. And one of the reasons in one design boats it's so important to, re to attend regattas is because you get that hands-on experience how the fleet behaves and the, the higher the level of racing the more boat to boat tactics becomes important and that's why you need to attend those those big regattas as as often as you can i think for a lot of full-time sailors to aim for about one a month is is about right balance wise Maybe if you're a windsurfer, you need more recovery, you do slightly less. Uh, maybe, a, say, a, a laser sailor, we do slightly more than the 470s or other boats which have technical work to do at home. So upwind tactics is, is really managing the fleet and maybe specifically your, your rivals. Um, if you need to finish close to another boat or specifically beat another boat in a race, that's your boat-to-boat -boat tactics. And downwind tactics is also looking at that boat to boat. Where are we positioning ourselves relative to the other boats? So if there was a, a tidal factor or differences in pressure across the course that, that favoured one side upwind, well, we want to position ourselves in that way downwind. But actually having a clean lane and clear wind, both up and downwind, is, is possibly going to overall that. Whereas when we look at race strategy, the definition I want to use here for race strategy is what you would do in the absence of other boats. So in other words, if you were sailing around the course purely as a time trial, trying to minimise your distance, uh, sorry, minimise the time sailed, um, that's, that's your race strategy. So unfortunately, sometimes your, your strategy is going to get overruled by your tactics. So a good example, upwind, you may want to go left. Here we're looking at uh, converging wind in a northern hemisphere. So for people uh, who sail in the UK, you can imagine that's a, a south-facing coast, which is where we do most of our sailing with an easterly breeze. We expect more wind on the left. 
So assuming there's no difference in current, etc., we want to go left. That's our strategy upwind. And then the tactics may change because if somebody's giving us a lot of wind shadow, uh, we may need to, to foot off or do two tacks to clean our wind because we, we really wouldn't want to sail the whole upwind in, in somebody else's dirty air. And it's the same downwind. The, the downwind strategy may be uh, very related to the upwind strategy. So in this example, you want to go very close to the shore where there's more wind, uh, but the tactics, they may override that. And sometimes it's a percentage game. And by that, I mean, if most of the fleet has gone one way, you might want to go uh, with the fleet, but just staying slightly more towards the favoured side. So it's very important you think about strategy and tactics. And strategy is often something you can decide at least 24 hours before the race, having a look at the forecasts and also the, the timetables and things like that. So that information should already be there. And it's one of the things that you could also sit down and analyze after. So I remember, uh, perhaps not that fondly, but spending a lot of time measuring currents at different times of day in Rio for the 2016 Olympics, because that was a really important thing on some race courses. So I'm not gonna go into the, into the rules in great detail, because I think there's some people who would uh, definitely have a, a greater knowledge of the rules than myself and also it's something I think you could easily talk uh, for, for two hours about I'm trying to, to keep these talks uh, as an idea uh, factory so people can think what they need to work on what they can learn more about rather than going into great detail but you need to consider uh, before you play a game you, you need to to know the rules you wouldn't try and play chess if you didn't know the the moves that all the pieces on the board can do and if anything just to read part two of the rules and part two just covers with instances where boats meet so actually that's where most of the protests come in um, because we can use the rules aggressively and you'll see it in medal races where perhaps uh, only uh, one or two people have the opportunity to win a medal um, so they, they literally end up fighting for that medal, but you can use it defensively as well just to maintain your position. But unless you know the rules, it's really difficult to have a good um, to have a good race because you're not sure what what the situation is, and you've got to have a good knowledge. Uh, otherwise, you you could waste your evenings in the protest room. So my guess uh, is the rules will still change. Um, at the end of 2020 and the rule book is updated uh, every four years so uh, small changes uh, do happen and you need to be clear what's happening and also understand the definitions so for example a proper course or a close haul course uh, may sometimes be the same thing but they're not the same definition so if you fill out a protest form correctly I think you're you're going to be looking in much better situations. So just to clearly understand what those uh, the basics are before you go on the water. And I think a lot of us have had quite a lot of time off the water recently. So perhaps such a good opportunity to improve the uh, understanding of the racing rules. The one thing I would say, quite a few people have been doing the e-sailing, which is perhaps a good way to have... Uh, clubs getting together and stall racing and if you enjoy a zoom meeting you can still chat away to each other uh, but the rules of e-sailing are not uh, the the same of um, proper as it were on the water sailing so something to be very aware of i did wonder if i should have put these slides in a in a slightly uh, different order uh, but this is very much um, part of your preparation uh, the meteorology and I think finding good sources of weather information is perhaps far easier now uh, than it was 20 years ago. Indeed, uh, sometimes I feel there's too much information. It seems to be common to see sailors in the boat park comparing weather forecasts. And, and you don't get to choose what the weather does. Um, you just have to choose a, a good source of information. So again, having this um, written down is so important so you can clearly see which forecast 
was the most accurate and I will use some weather models for example wind guru uh, in some venues and I may use other weather models for example predict wind in, um, in, in a different venue and that's just through experience which one seems to be getting closer and you also have a little bit of knowledge uh, when the weather forecasts tend to be accurate when they don't tend to be accurate and you have to understand the forecast so if a forecast is looking like it's going to be uh, a good sea breeze but then you look out the window and we've got the bushfires we had in Australia and it's very hazy well that's going to block the sea breeze we need to understand that's not going to happen and timing is something which is still a little bit difficult with forecasts so we know there's a cold front approaching but exactly what time it's going to hit island we don't know exactly um, but if you understand the forecast then you can see what's happening and if it's happening sooner or later because what we're interested in is using the forecasts so if it's a sea breeze day and we notice that we have a northeasterly breeze here in the UK, followed by a period of flat calm, followed by a southwesterly and lots of nice, big, fluffy clouds. We will be looking at those clouds and those cumulus clouds will be telling us the sea breeze is, is coming. It's building and we know to expect an increase in wind strength and also to expect an increase uh, or rather um, a, a veer the wind going to the right so the numbers on your compass are going to be going up and I think sometimes just psychologically that helps a huge amount just being properly prepared and the other thing is for, for people who don't have the luxury uh, of a coach uh, perhaps a wrong word there but I would like to think coaching has make a big difference to make sure you're properly prepared with your sailing kit so you're wearing the right thing because just because you launch in five knots doesn't mean you're going to be racing in five knots and a little rule of thumb regardless of the forecast i think it's always good to have too much food and too much water because there's no harm to bring any back um, but being out of energy and especially being dehydrated can make a huge difference to your overall performance so I'm going to uh, bring this to a, a, an end here because I'm quite keen if there's any questions um, to, to answer them. I don't know if Alex has something that he would like to add, but I think hopefully we can all get back on the water soon. And we're working very hard uh, in the UK to, to get back to, um, well, what, what we all love. So at the moment, we're, we're getting ready to go and do some casual sailing and we've got some very um, aggressive social distances in place so for example if you live in Wales or Scotland it's a different set of rules to somebody just down the road but I hope over time we can move to club racing where we have more people in the same spot and then obviously the the end game it will be great to be back to to national and international competition and I just really hope that all our friends here on zoom everybody uh, is as sensible as they can be because if people um, need to get rescued or, or do inappropriate it, it makes the sport look bad and at the same time if we all go out and I think sailing has just got to be one of the best sports to social distance uh, if we all go out and, um, and behave well then uh, I think it's a, it's a really good thing for the, for the future of the sport and I think we now have a, a real chance to to improve our sport because when you look at the big picture the vast majority of sailors uh, club recreational sailors people who sail for fun and that's actually where we're going to start by rebuilding the sport so club level lots of fun and then hopefully those aspirational sailors uh, will will pop out so alex that's my um coming to my final slide uh, I thought I would leave that up here. I'm trying trying not to be too active on social media. Now we have a huge uh, <laughs> huge amount more more time on land. Um, but I put my website, my Facebook page, group, Twitter, and Instagram up there. So hopefully that will be of interest to to people. Um. Thank you very much, uh, John. It was uh, very good and it's, uh, it was summarizing a, a lot of things and uh, putting 
things into the right place, especially knowing that we are going to be soon on the water, just tidying up our thoughts. That was a really good talk. And uh, if you could just uh, mention, um, I know you wrote a couple of books uh, with the different uh, patterns of the advices. So you've been uh, having a really nice talk, but uh, that's more detailed cover than one of your books. If you can just mention in which one we can find more detailed information. Oh, thank you. Few, <laughs> that, that, was be, that was gonna be my final slide on, uh, on the part two, but I'll try and ring uh, through them all very quickly because yeah. I, I just think hopefully there's something there for everyone. So I had a very serious neck injury uh, about 20 years ago. I had a, a triple spinal fusion and that's how I ended up having seven months to write a book. And that book was Be Your Own Sailing Coach, which uh, a lot of these topics have come from. And uh, that was actually the book that uh, Lily read and she really enjoyed it. And then she asked me to coach her um, on the basis of um, finding that useful. So uh, that became a second edition, which is Coach Yourself to Win. So that's an updated book but actually with uh, just 12 chapters rather than the 20 we're running through here. So that was a bit like uh, asking a father to decide which of his baby's arms they wanted to, to cut off. Having written 20 chapters, I was really rather torn about which ones to, to leave out. Um, so those books are very much on the self-coaching. And then um, I did uh, uh, the same for, for tactics because I just thought that's such an important thing so the original book there was, was again, Be Your Own Tactics Coach. A um, bit, bit of a theme there because I realise not everybody has access to professional coaching. Um, and then that got a second edition, which is uh, Tactics Made Simple. And it, it really is that. It's lots and lots of diagrams, the things that as an international coach, the mistakes and good things that you see just day in, day out. So that was quite an easy book to write but hard to put into um, yeah the best format that was the hard thing and then the, the final book it makes me feel quite old to have written five books but there we go otherwise but they, they feel left out if I miss it training to win is actually specifically the exercises you need to do uh, on the water to improve your sailing so I, I did some work uh, in China with a fantastic place I'm probably going to mispronounce it, uh, Vang Hung Sailing Academy. And we, we needed to, to help the coaches know what exercises to, to write. So I thought if I'm writing this down for them, I might as well put it in a book. So there's lots of pictures in there of um, beginner topper sailors. And if, uh, if you can get lots of Chinese topper sailors whose first language isn't English to do uh, a really good rabbit, then I think uh, that that felt like some success in itself. So I hope there's something there for, for everybody. Yeah, and there's uh, one question uh, regard, from the public and it's uh, probably related to everybody who will start sailing really soon. We won't have a fleet in the close future and most of us will go out on the water on their own. And one of the guys asking here uh, is, uh, what to focus really when you're sailing alone? What to to focus on yeah so I've, I've rushed through this because I'm I'm very aware that uh, there's an awful lot to, to cover but the whole idea of being your own sailing coach is you actually sit down in the beginning and you create one of those dartboards in fact there's a the dartboard in the back of the book so you write down your strengths and weaknesses so if you look at the, um, the, the first sort of slide we did so you score yourself 10 out of 10 uh, for something then you're perfect zero out of ten you you can't do it and the best improvement is always going to be working on your weaknesses I did find it quite interesting I did this with some Finn sailors who were quite um, uh, lowly rating themselves five or six out of ten for strength and then I did the same exercise with oppie sailors who were rating themselves eight or nine so I, I do need to point out it's subjective and fitness is something we can cover next week but you do need to work on your weaknesses and going back to my restart sailing slide um, although we may if you like be sailing on our own I would strongly recommend 
to sail at the same time as somebody else because it doesn't matter how good a sailor you are if something completely unexpected happens so uh yeah just stay safe everybody that's a really important thing thank you so much uh, for all your time john and um there are no more questions and uh we are all very happy with your talk <laughs> and uh let's hope we meet next week i'll be here <laughs> <laughs> i i always wonder what happens if there's very few questions it means that i've done a very good or a very bad job answering people's questions but i uh... think it was a very good <laughs> job because it was a really really clear and uh very uh, slow pace like the, you didn't rush through the things so it was a crystal crystal clear uh, presentation thank you thank you Alex and thank you for everybody who's, who's taken part <laughs>